Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom with our host, Bob Olson, who will now introduce today's show and speaker. The question of life's December is this. How can the retired and the elderly find joy in advancing years? Winston Churchill had that same problem, and uh, this is what he wrote. Worry is a spasm of the emotion. The mind catches hold of something, and it will not let go. One can only gently insinuate something else into its convulsive grasp. If the something else is rightly chosen, it illuminates another field of interest. Change is the key. To be really happy in elder years, it is no use doing what you have liked. You have got to like what you will do. Change is the key. Winston suggests we should have two or three hobbies, and his own choices were serious reading in another language, and especially for him, uh, the art of painting. He pursued it, he excelled in it, and he wrote booklets about it. As for ourselves, the panel today is on a three-week shopping spree, shopping for alternative sources of elder joy. Last week, we discussed sources found in avocational work, in charitable service, and in social outreach. Next week, we will look at joy found in studies, teaching in all its aspects, and spiritual progress. But today, we seek joy in the pursuit of art, literature, and science. So, panel, is there joy to be found in pursuit of art, literature, and science? Are there any examples? We're thinking. We're thinking carefully. <laughs> no, no, I have, I have a great example. Okay. <laughs> um, because of you guys talking about this subject, of aging, I think it's part of the reason I've got this inspiration. So listen to this. I got this inspiration for the new project. Okay, so I had decided about three years ago to stop writing books because I've written 60 of them, of which 50, 50 are published books. So I really don't need to write more books, you know. So anyway, so I've been editing, you know, anthologies, working on helping other people write books, things like that. But I keep kept getting this little nudge. There's something else you could do which would be different. Oh, is that Richard? Sounds like that could be Richard. There was a beer. Richard, are you on now? Go ahead, Rhonda. Go ahead, what? Rhonda. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I wanted Richard to hear this too. But anyway, so this is what I, this is the title of the book. I've been going around saying nine toes, I have nine toes in eternity when people ask my age. I say I'm 79 and I have nine toes in eternity, right? And the title of this book would be Nine Toes in Eternity, Images of Grace for Old Catholics. Okay, and each page would have one of these funny images like nine toes in eternity or I should be a lighthouse, not a captain, and it would have beautiful illustrations by my daughter Diana, who's a fantastic painter and a cartoonist, see, and so it would be a legacy book to the family, but it would also be I'm picturing it as an 8 by 11 um, a coffee table book, things that people could give to their elderly relatives to give them wonderful, amusing, and beautiful things to contemplate. Just one liner is like that. So very what do you good. think, guys? I think that's very good. That's and it true. wouldn't be just mine, it would be any that my dear friends on WCAT Open Door come across. It wouldn't have to be just things of mine. It could be anything I find that's like a one-liner that could give people through the image a different sense of old age. 
we could each have a toehold. A toehold, yes, toeholds. Okay, I'll put that in the process. Uh, instead By of the way, I think nine, Richard so... is on now. Rhonda, I think Richard is on now. Richard? Hello, Richard? I thought I heard the ding, but apparently not. Sorry. Oh, okay, then this little, well, whatever. Anyhow, so what do you think? How's that for a creative, easy, different idea? Well, we're for it. You're for it. Okay, one for it. Anyone against it? I see some toes wiggling out there. Well, Al, <laughs> you're, Al, what do you think? I I think that's fine. Um, the more different from your previous work, uh, the better, according to Winston's uh, prescription. But, oh, and okay. I, so you don't at least disapprove. So you're so-so. Well, what, I, about I, you, what about you, Bob? Does it sound nice to you? Sounds very good to me. All right. Let, let me give you something, an example of something totally different. Uh, you know my, my uh, career was in uh, aerospace engineering and, and management. Uh, I'm looking, and when I was a young second lieutenant, I started with classical guitar and got too busy, so I put that guitar down 53 years ago. I'm thinking seriously of picking it up. That's something oh, totally different. Guitar. Totally different from anything I've really done in the last 53 years. Oh, uh, have Pablo, you, if, Pablo Casals, right? Well, I've had, uh, uh, I'm going to be the next Segovia, I think. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 I, I, hope, I hope you're not, this is Jim again, I hope you're not overlooking the banjo. Uh, oh, <laughs> that thing. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I didn't know that. Guitarists despise banjo players, is that true? Well, I, I don't know if I, I don't know I, if uh, any of us or, or the listeners can properly pronounce ukulele. Ukulele, yeah. I don't know. I I thought a, a banjo was just a, a guitar that starved to death. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. So now, now, now just, just a second. We got to back up here. <clears throat> Speaking of instruments and instrumentality. You know the difference between a trombone player and a dead snake on the road? I'll tell no. you. The difference is the snake had a gig. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. We can only, so, go, oh, up. We can only go up from there. We can only go up. That's right. No, no, no. I... Jim, okay, as a midwife of other people's books, You've got to write a, a fun, clean joke book of all your jokes. For those of you who don't know Jim as well as I do, if you go out to dinner with Jim or visit him, he always has five funny jokes like this lined up for you. Well, that's so, only because I tune into our competition. We get competition. We, we panelists, we get competition from the good, clean laugh of the day. And anybody who's interested in uh, alleviating the burdens of the elderly could check in with good, clean laugh of the day. It's free uh, on your machines. All right, all right. But still, there are older people who would prefer to have a funny book with cartoons to go with each of these jokes. Are they copyrighted, these jokes? No, they're 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 submitted by listeners, and they're All archived. Right. They're archived, but 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 we we can't lose the thread here. Now, uh, in in terms of of art, seriously speaking, and good reading, I highly recommend uh, an address of His Holiness Benedict the Sixteenth, given in the Good View Sistine Chapel. In 2009, and you can easily get that off of the computer. And it's not that long. And uh, you know, towards the end, he speaks of what he'd been speaking of, the via pulchritudinis, the way of beauty, the way of beauty, 
which he which he calls an artistic and aesthetic journey and a journey of faith. And if we are evangelists, this way of beauty, I, I think, is a marvelous uh, focus for us. Once upon a time back in the day, I wrote a master's uh, thesis on Simone Weil, uh, a Jewish writer of profound intensity, whose brother was one of the greatest mathematicians of this country, who died in England during World War II. She had gone there to work with de Gaulle, and uh, she wrote this, and guess who cites it? My eyes opened up. Uh, guess who cites it? Benedict the, the 16th. Uh, says Simone Weil, in all that awakens within us the pure and authentic sentiment of beauty, there truly is the presence of God. There is a kind of incarnation of God in the world of which beauty is the sign. Now, L, this last line will we'll get your attention. Beauty is the experimental proof that incarnation is possible. Wow. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, I love that. Say that yeah. last line again, Jim. The, the sight? Beauty? No, say that line again. Oh, the line again. Beauty is the experimental proof that incarnation is possible. Oh, I love that. So all, all people who are listening or participating that are working in, in art are, are doing something that is evangelizing, if only indirectly, and sometimes it can be very direct. Uh, there's a terrific uh, presentation along these very lines uh, that comes from Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And it's what was read for him when he received the Nobel Prize in Literature. And it's a far cry between Alexander Solzhenitsyn receiving the Nobel Prize in Literature and Bob Dylan, <laughs> this year's recipient. <laughs> Let's just say we haven't made any progress. But Solzhenitsyn's focus is on the classical transcendentals, truth, beauty, and goodness. And Solzhenitsyn says, truth has been abused and distorted and propagandized so much. And goodness has been distorted and aped and, and bowdlerized. Think of all the other negatives that you can. And in our time, beauty is perhaps the best way to touch upon the truth and the good. They can be restored by way of beauty. And again, people who are interested in art from, from high culture to low culture, uh, if they're really interested in opening up avenues to the beautiful, they are evangelists. Amen. Yeah. Which I think is something the church has always known. If you go into the great cathedrals, the, the whole interior or a, 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 a speech, if you will, a, a silent speech of beauty. I'm thinking particularly in Montreal, the French cathedral there is just stunning. You walk in, you'd never want to walk out of that place. It's so beautiful. And uh, <coughs> so the church has always known that that beauty is is a statement of of things beyond uh, beyond our uh, secular understanding. Oh, I have a um, anecdote with that. When my son Charles was eight years old, we went. It was our twenty fifth wedding anniversary, so we went back to all the places that we had been in in Europe that we loved. So we went to Chartres Cathedral. And we were walking around, and we found him just almost in a trance, staring at everything. And he looked at it, and he said, because of this, I will never leave the church. And, mm. 
he didn't leave the church exactly. I mean, you know, well, um, yeah. he was still a practicing Catholic, more or less, when he, he was a practicing Catholic, even though a kind of um, sinful Catholic when he left this earth by suicide, but he did cling to Jesus, and he was at a monastery at the time, so that's a sort of consolation. But yeah. besides that, my twin sister, when I converted, I converted through truth, mainly. And um, my twin sister was a dancer, not a philosopher. She really converted through listening over and over again to Verdi's Requiem Mass. The beauty of it touched her in some way that made her soul fall from atheism <clears throat> into the world of Jesus. In terms of uh, the reach of beauty, perhaps for, for some of our listeners, the prayer book, the Magnificat, <laughs> that the Dominican order puts out, uh, seems to be very popular, very well received. And part of its appeal, I think, is the role that beauty plays in it. And the art editor for Magnificat, Father Michael Morris, uh, died r rather suddenly uh, a few months ago, as in maybe two, three months ago. And the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology in Berkeley, California, Berkeley slash Oakland, has just put together a, a book uh, of his artwork and his commentaries from the Magnificat, and it's called Regina Chaley, uh, Queen, uh, Queen of Heaven. And if uh, any of our listeners are interested, if you were to go to the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology website, which is just wonderful in so many ways, you could watch the uh, book launch for this that was yesterday. It's, it's just half an hour. It's just really, really very, very good in terms of the way of beauty via pulcritudinis. It's a it's, uh, just really memorable book and book launch. Would you repeat that website? Name. Well, it's the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology. Uh, now, no surprise, they've got the letters. <laughs> DSPT, Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology. And they have a just an excellent, excellent website. And this is something from yesterday. Okay. Which my wife and I were just delighted by. Art and Essays on the Beauty of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now, since I currently have have the, the mic, as it were, uh, maybe two or three days ago, uh, Pope Francis spoke about uh, sparks of beauty and gave nine different ways uh, that beauty could be brought into play in in evangelizing. Sparks of beauty, if you were to go to the, the machine, I always call it the computer here, and type in Pope Francis, sparks of beauty, you would have this. And one of the interesting sparks of beauty he had, and it's, it's thematic for him, is the Sparks of beauty in the peripheries, and what he had in mind was art as it sometimes uh, flares up, since we're talking about sparks of beauty, art as it sometimes flares up in, in say, slums, skid row areas, deserted areas, isolated areas, and you certainly see that in Los Angeles, where where we live, actually, we live in the pearl of the area, Inglewood, but Los Angeles. And, and driving through certain areas, all of a sudden, you'll see Our Lady of Guadalupe, bright colors on the side of a little rundown market store. And there it is, 
popping up. It's really splendid. Oh, that's a wonderful. I have a related example to this, which gave me enormous joy. In New York, I heard about a group. Uh, someone organized this thing that middle-class people, Catholics from New Jersey who lived well, would come down for a whole month on the weekends to some slum area of New York, and they would they would get the leader of this block who was whoever was the natural leader of this block of of rundown apartments would lead the people there, and they would put up these people from New Jersey, and they would, the, the people from New Jersey would help them clean up all the filth in these houses, clean up the whole place. Then at the end, they would have a dinner out with some of the summer. I think they'd have a dinner outside prepared by the people living in the slums, and someone would make a graffiti picture on the walls of one of the houses right on the block for everyone to see. Mm. And they did this year after year, and you could see these things. Isn't that amazing? So that would be a spark of beauty. Yeah, all excellent sections example. Of beauty. Excellent example. This is Bob. thing I was thinking about is that when we see all these beautiful churches, it would be nice if people could be inspired to dress, you know, in a more beautiful way to go along with the churches. Mm. Amen you know, to that. To match, to match the beauty of the church or try to. I think, uh, Bob, one way that uh, uh, you and I and, and others of, of perhaps our age group could lead the way here would be with the use of full-size bow ties. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jim. I'd like to see bow ties. I'd like to see bow ties spring up throughout the churches of Christendom. Okay, uh, now send this to me not, for not, my... Not these, not these tidy little things, but full-blown yes. bow ties, full-blown bow ties. Okay, Jim, now you've got to send me this thing on an email to stick into nine toes in eternity, and it would read, treat the people around you by getting, making for yourself a full-size bow tie. Yeah, and so then let we'd, them, have, we'd have a picture of this. Let them know that we're fit to be tied. <laughs> really? Oh, put that in. Can you send that to me? Well, I, if I, I, it, you know, Randy, if I can remember, if I can remember that one. <laughs> oh, it that's sounds very, very nice. Now, I have a different take on that altogether. When people started complaining about the teenagers wearing, men particularly wearing grunge, which all women too, young, young, you know, teenagers, I said, for all of us who have teenagers who left the church, we are so ecstatic if they come to church. We would never say dress up or don't come. But that's not what you meant, but that's the way I feel about it. No, oh, we'd lead by positive example. That's right. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I, uh, this is Al. I am um, looking for joy, uh, uh, sources of joy for the elderly. Uh, if they would just listen to you two, they could, all the elderly would become stand-up comedians. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I don't know. They might tell us to sit down in a big hurry. But, Al, if I could connect to something that you led with, one of the examples was uh, reading, even if it was difficult, in a foreign language. Yes, that, uh, Winston, that was one of the things he uh, recommended yeah. and apparently did. Uh, and he, prob he mentioned, uh, of course, he's English, and he mentioned German and Spanish and Italian. Uh, I don't know which one he took after, but uh, I, you know I can barely get the English language done. Well, I, I just want to put in a plug for a fellow who goes by the name of Reginald, 
And Father Reginald uh, was the, the Latinist, the chief Latinist for the Vatican up until maybe four years ago. He's 76, and uh, last year he published uh, the first of what's projected to be a multi-volume work, which work is all his teaching materials in Latin, chiefly to seminarians. And, and the title is, uh, I, I want to say it in Latin because that's what the title is, but it, I'll say it in English afterwards, Osa Latinitatis, The Bones of Latin. And it's truly an engaging work, just really engaging. And I think one of the, the, the keys to doing these big reading projects when when you're older or when you're younger is is the 10 minute a day strategy father uh, Jim Shaw who's well into his 80s who retired from Georgetown who's now trapped the word is used advisedly uh, deliberately trapped in the Dominican, uh, sorry, not Dominican, Jesuit retreat house. Uh, he, he's always, for years and years and years, recommended books. That's one of his things. He's the guy that got me reading Chesterton. But at any rate, every once in a while he says, and so now for 10 minutes every day I read such and such. Well, I think if you're going to do a language, you might might very well actually follow through on that by doing it. Ten minutes a day, and this Osa Latini Tatis is is be perfect for somebody who wanted to learn a little Latin. Latin, yeah, Al. I, Latin actually is on my list. I, I, it's just not high enough on that list. That I've got, <laughs> I've got, I've got three or four people all interested in getting together and and learning Latin, uh, including my publisher uh, Jim Ridley, but uh, I, I've got other things going on. I right. uh, run. Rhonda got me going on writing 15 years ago, and I find that hard to stop. Uh-huh. And uh, uh, I can blame Rhonda for that one. And, uh, if we could get Rhonda going 10 minutes a day on Latin, and then she could quit harassing us uh, uh, to get involved that, that, with her projects. Now, now, that's a positive thought, yes. <laughs> but uh, I guess my, uh, my list is, uh, is uh, writing, though when I get my current operation done, I think I might quit for a little while, but uh, years and years ago, I took a painting lesson, and I actually painted one painting, and it's hanging on the wall, and it's really credible. It's good, so, uh, you know, I understand a little bit experientially what Winston Churchill was trying to get at in his little book about painting, but uh, so I guess my list right now is writing at the top, which I I think I'm going to have to stop that sooner or later. Uh, except now, now we're on just talking about a writer's group, and I'm going to get hooked into that. No. And and, uh, and that classical guitar, I really think I'm going to pick that thing up after 53 years. Oh, okay, now, here's the challenge. We're going to oh, pray dear. you up on this thing, Al. We okay. Pray you up. Then at the beginning of each open door, you compose a piece in a classical guitar. And oh. start the program with this classical guitar piece by you. How about that? Played uh, by I, you. I think that's a sure prescription for losing our audience. No, no, no. <laughs> Modest well, people get you nowhere. Yeah. No, no uh, lyrics from Bob Dylan, though. Okay, yeah. That's a rule. Uh, yeah. I, I'd like to, yeah, maybe we can get back to the subject here, actually, in a minute here. Uh I would like to speak for science as a pursuit of the elderly. Uh, I, most elderly are not going to go looking for scientific tomes, but there's a lot of uh, popular writing going on in astrophysics of all things, and I have found that most fascinating. They, they explain it without all the math and all the, the difficulties, and there's some w- wonderful work going on in astrophysics right now, including... As uh, as we spoke about in one of our earlier talks, the fact that astrophysics now has proof that there is God, and uh, and hardly anybody knows that. 
and uh, it needs to be shouted from the rooftops. So uh, as a pursuit of uh, astrophysics on a on a uh, uh, amateur level, if you will, uh, that's something that, that the people really ought to look into. Well, I, I think an awful lot of people would get interested in connections with science. Uh, on that same theme, there is a writer uh, named Gerard Verschuren, who's not Polish, he's Dutch. I'm Dutch. <laughs> so I I could recommend, not because he's Dutch, although there are those who say that if it ain't Dutch, it ain't much, but uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Gerard Verschuren, and I've sent one of his things, I think, on to Al before, but he writes books that are, I, how, what could I call them, semi-popular. And... Um, uh, I'll just give you a list. He's got Darwin's Philosophical Legacy, um, uh, God and Evolution, What Makes You Tick, A New Paradigm, How's That, A New Paradigm for Neuroscience. Uh, it's All in the Genes, Really. Now, hear about this, The Destiny of the Universe. Uh, and now, his latest book is simply um, um, titled... Aquinas and Modern Science, A New Synthesis of Faith and Reason. And it's got a forward by Father Joe Katersky from Fordham and another uh, plug from John Canassis from the University of St. Thomas in Houston. And this is from Angelical Press, but he, he's a great science writer, and he's a deeply Catholic. <laughs> Now, one of the things that I'm hearing listening to all of you is that because, by the way, since the last program, I actually formally retired from formal teaching. I'm still doing all sorts of workshops, lectures, missions, da 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 But I'm retired from formal teaching. But what I'm hearing is the glee in the voices of men I knew when they were working nine to five and more, who are always tired, who now have this gleeful lilt in your voices from doing things that you probably always wanted to do besides being in your time wonderful, wonderful teachers, right? Yeah, yeah, I think that's the point, Winston, uh, or, or I can slide into it. What the point Winston had was you have to do something different uh, you know, or at least a modification of what you've done all your life before, and uh, to to uh, to uh, find a, a real new uh, a renewal of joy, if you will. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> oh, now now I want to put in there one caveat, however. Okay. You know, I sometimes try to do something that I've never done before except very, very occasionally. So one of them is I had a friend who's a terrific artist, and she said what she wanted to do was volunteer in the convalescent home to teach old, you get old people into art. So I said, yeah. oh, practice on me. I want to get into art. Okay. So she practiced with me how to teach old people who aren't good at art or don't think they're good at art how to do something. And with the exception of one picture that I did, I did it, I decided I wanted to draw a picture of the way Jesus, Mary, and Joseph look in terms of my psychology. They look very Jewish and very rustic in my picture. And then I have a little little figure of myself like the inner child in the arms of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. And even though it's a very primitive, it looks like some sort of folk art, it's very <laughs> primitive, but the artist sort of made it a little better. But I treasure that picture, and I look at it every day. So that was a great success. But then I bought all these paints and all these uh, canvases, and figured I would be doing this for the rest of my life, and I really don't feel like doing it at all. And I don't think, you know, we 
sometimes maybe maybe these things, what I, I would like to say to people, if something comes to your mind or someone suggests you do something new, instead of automatically saying no, say yes and see, and good could come out of it even if it isn't the huge hobby that would occupy every spare minute of your day in the future. It could still be good to do one thing along those lines, like play one piece on your grandson's keyboard, <laughs> even <laughs> if you don't want to be play the piano every day, something like that. So I think that could be a good thing. And, uh, you know, the variety of spice of life, et cetera, et cetera. That sounds good to me. Yeah, now, I think if, we're... Go, go ahead. ahead. If, if uh, this is Jim, if, if we could make a connection between what you're saying uh, in science, uh, it would be in terms of, I guess the term is neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity. Uh, and this connects with the incarnation, too, the, the bodily dimension, the very real bodily dimension of what it is to be a human being. When we do something like teach, or when we do something like um, uh, art, or, or music, or something terribly negative, use drugs, if, if we do this habitually, then our, our brains are, are actually, in strategic ways, restructured. Our, our neural system has a plasticity about it, and, and plastic can be malleable or it can, it can harden, as, as we know. Uh, think of good Tupperware, for example. But the idea is, well, we use this term breakthrough. <laughs> In a way, we need to break through the not-so-plastic neuroplasticity that we've developed in, in various ways. And, of course, it, it can't be done totally. It shouldn't be done totally. We don't want to turn into silly putty, that's for sure. But there's a, a, a real tangibility. It's, it's our, our very neural system is affected in this sort of thing. Yeah, actually, uh, Winston Churchill in this little booklet I keep referring to uh, implies that. He, he says uh, to get away from worry and to do something totally different and to find joy in that is to use a different part of the brain that you haven't used. And, uh, and that's, I think, what you're talking about, neuroplasticity. Uh, you, 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 uh, and by the act of doing something totally different, you rebuild a new you in terms of uh, mental capacity. I, uh, I I can remember one experience of that myself. Uh, when I first went to college uh, and got involved in uh, uh, in uh, analytical geometry and in and, and, uh, having a senior moment here, but anyway, mathematics uh, it, it opened up a whole new world to me. Uh, and and I know my whole life perspective changed with the analytical geometry and calculus. As, as an Here's example, a connection, you know. Here's a and direct it, connection with what you're saying, says Butinsky. Here's a direct connection. Uh, I often <laughs> argued for teaching logic uh, if for no other reason, and this is formal and symbolic logic for no other reason than it gives students the idea of structure, that, that argument is, is not like throwing sand at people. A real argument has a real structure. Um, I, I think people involved in any number of pursuits in life take away from their involvement, that such and such an activity has a structure to it. And that's something you can certainly gain from doing logic. Now, in your case, it was analytic geometry. Now, you're not going to do analytic geometry every day, but 
but you know there is a structure in things. And to know there is a structure in things is to know that there's a truth of things. And to know that there's a truth of things is to know that there's a deep down goodness within things. And all of that is bringing the gospel of creation to people. Yeah, I, you know, I, uh, a while back I applied uh, to teach math here at local school and decided to, to, you know, to hire a younger, cheaper person, but that was okay. But they asked me what, what was my definition of mathematics in general, and I said mathematics is the descriptive language. It, mathematics is God's descriptive language of the universe. Mm. Oh, say that again. That was good. Mathematics is God's descriptive language of the universe. Ah, not beauty. Little it, numbers? It, it describes... <laughs> it, <laughs> well, that, Plato certainly, you know, the Platonists thought that. Pythagoras, you know, the Platonists were... Plato was influenced by Pythagoras, and numbers have a huge role. So there are these very different ideas about what's the essence of the universe. For instance, I heard someone say that... that all of reality is basically sound. Probably he was a musician. <laughs> well, the connections between music and math are, are clear, the, well known, often discussed. Yeah, all right. Richard, yeah. are you on there now? Richard, have you joined us? No. Nah. I heard another. I heard another uh, beep in there. Maybe, maybe, not. Bob, after you get someplace, you should try to call him. I'm worried about him now. I mean, it's very yeah, possible my... that he just does something on Friday mornings and doesn't, he doesn't drive. He has a driver, and sometimes other people drive him and so on and so forth. So it could be that he's at something where he can't get away easily back to a quiet place, but it also could be that he's in the hospital or something, so... I'll give him a call pray. right now. Let us pray for dear Richard, our colleague, on this virtual, this virtual seminar. Hmm. Now, let's see. Jim has met Richard Garrity, and... Um, Jim has, and also Bob, but you haven't, uh, you haven't so far, Al, met Richard Garrity, right? Or you've seen him on EWTN? I spent two days with him last uh, two years oh, ago. Oh, that's right, that's right. So we all, know, we all know each other by face. Or who doesn't know? Jim and Bob don't know each other. No, Jim I've and seen, Al I've don't seen know pictures each other. of him. I've seen pictures of him. So, oh. uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh dear. Well, um, let's see. We shouldn't. I think we should go on. And um, this has turned out to be a very interesting topic. Which you you broke up the topic. See, the 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 book I wrote is uh, Finding Christ in the Joys and Sufferings of Aging. Was not about this kind of thing exactly, though it touches on a lot of these things. And my strategy in the book was to first get into the joys in such a way that it wouldn't be so heavy for people to read, they wouldn't feel depressed reading it kind of thing. But um, in any case, that book is uh, full of juicy quotations from all kinds of literary, literary people that are just delightful, as well as very heavy stuff like deathbed scenes of the saints and proofs for the immortality of the soul and things like that. So if you're interested in that book, if you, if you look at your screen now where you're listening, it says en route in big letters. If you spell en route that way and put in en route books and media, you, will, um, you can find this book very cheap. Um, <laughs> Uh, on route books. I wrote it years ago, but it's now being distributed by on route books. But uh, one thing I wanted to say is sometimes people could be listening to something like this and say, what? You mean you've never experienced the terrible pains of aging, the loss of the people you love the most, the, um, the physical sufferings that you can't get rid of with any painkillers and on and on and on. 
And the, the point would be that even though those things are true and might outweigh a lot of the joys of aging and they'll never be outweighed until eternity in uh, heaven, but at the same time, it doesn't mean you can't have any of these good things of aging, even if you have that pain and that loss. Uh, right. the, the sparks of beauty. Al, I, I, I think there's a lot to, to that, Rhonda, but I also think, uh, I guess I'm going to use myself as an example, it is possible in elder years to have a to reach a steady state of if you will of of joy where it really doesn't matter whether you're in pain or not or whether or you know there are problems or uh, or uh, of any sort uh it it just doesn't matter anymore i and i find only recently uh even as my wife was dying uh you know, I was certainly concerned, and I was certainly doing what I could for her. But in the background was this steady state of joy, and I would suggest you can only get to that state uh, with knowledge of God, the reality, the certainty of God. Uh, at that point, really nothing matters, and uh, you, you reach a steady state of, of sheer joy that just goes on and on. Now, uh, that's hard to do, uh, I guess. I, you know, I spent a lot of, I've gotten there without really realizing it at first. But, uh, uh, and ultimately we'll be talking about that next week anyway, uh, the uh, joy that comes from uh, uh, pursuit of, uh, from spiritual progress. Uh, but, uh, well, you, you, you mean, let's see, the problem is, is a spiritual joy that's different from emotional elation. Yeah, it's yes, different. yes, it has yes. A different, There's a different meaning to that. But at the same time, it seems to me most people, most people who are, let's say, have been at spirituality for a long, long time and trying to grow in holiness, would certainly say that you can experience simultaneously joy because of God and pain because of other things, that even though it seems that that would be an uneasy mix, it is a reality. It's a reality, uh, and, and I guess I've lived it the last uh, couple of years. And, uh, but it can only be explained as, as a result of grace. Yes. The Holy Spirit. I mean, it, there's no way to get there, right? I don't think, without uh, you can be exceedingly happy, but happy is not joy, uh, as as the the church would would describe it. Joy is 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 something totally different. Uh, even in in fact, if you go to the Catholic dictionary, it it really explains it better than I am. Joy is is a, a direct. Uh, uh, result of that charity that you can only have if if you're living in the spirit. Al, this no. is Bob again. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is this is Bob. I don't know if I've shared this on this program before, but uh, what you're explaining is a real powerful gift because it's it's a by by your example. Uh, I have a friend who was a Christian. His wife was a cradle, cradle Catholic, but he was he never became Catholic. But his mother-in-law got real sick and was suffering for years, three years. But she had this joy despite all that. She didn't show any of the, you know, suffering in that. She was always upbeat and everything. She just had this joy even though she had tremendous suffering. And after three years, she died. And my friend said, I want some of that. And he, <laughs> yes. converted, he converted to Catholicism to join his wife. Yeah, yeah, I but understand. He, and there's, now, a, there's a name for it. I guess there's a name for it. It's called redemptive suffering, actually. Yes, that's part of it. Uh Go ahead. I'm looking for a uh, I'm looking for a quotation here. 
Oh. Rhonda? Okay, well, well, while you're looking for a quotation, from my knowledge of Bob and Al, I know Bob much better than I know you, Al, because uh, even though we knew each other years ago when I taught in Corpus Christi and Al was the dean at the school where I was a professor, but I didn't know him that well. Now I'm getting to know him much, much better. But I would say both you and Bob emanate that feeling of serene, steady joy. And uh, I don't know, I certainly don't. How about you, Jim? <laughs> Not to ask too personal a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> I I think that there's much to be said on this subject. Well, your jokes are joyful. What, one, one thing that is central to all of this, absolutely central, and everything else has to be integrated around, is what we know of, of Jesus himself. And we can never forget that Jesus said on the cross, why have you abandoned me? And we cannot rule out moments or even years of feeling abandoned. And if we're going to have redemptive suffering, well, that redemptive suffering comes not because we're Stoics, but because we've joined our lives with the life of Christ, and the life of Christ has moments of abandonment. And praise the Lord, if we feel joy now, we we should never shy away from joy, and we should embrace joy. But the abandonment can't be ruled out. That that's that's part of what we know to be the case. Yeah. Uh, that that said, that said. There are so many powerful examples of of the, the witness of of serenity, uh, and one that I have in mind is uh, Edith Stein, uh, Jewish uh, heritage, drawn finally to Catholicism because of a dear friend of hers who lost her husband in World War One. And uh, Stein was just but deeply, deeply touched by this woman's resilience in the loss of her husband. And I guess, to, to use Bob's expression, she wanted some of that. So so we have that sort of thing. But but then at the same time, we have Mother Teresa, who who whose smile captivated millions of people and yet experienced a kind of abandonment. Uh, and one of the things that was sometimes brought forward, even during Mother Teresa's canonization process, was that, well, look, you're not supposed to have a dark night of the soul that you never get out of. <laughs> that's not right. Uh, that's a stage, and you're supposed to get out of it. Well, in, in her telling, she never did get out of it. Mm. So how God writes in our lives is is ultimately inscrutable. Uh, the church teaches repeatedly, and this was so even in a, a, a council, literally three, four hundred years ago, that whatever analogy we draw between ourselves and God, the disanalogy is always greater which is a way of preserving the truth that, that God in his essence is is unknowable. God in his essence is unknowable. We can know God through effects, but short of the beatific vision, we cannot know God in his essence. And even then, we we know part of God, but not all of God, even in the beatific vision. And so I think we should never be overly confident in charting these courses and paths of, of how things are going to work. I, uh, Al, I found the uh, definition I was looking for. It's in the Catholic uh, Dictionary. Uh, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, joy is not a virtue distinct from charity, 
but is an act or effect of charity. Uh, in other words, uh, there's a there's a level of love uh, that that uh, that you can a level of of joy that you reach only through total charity, total love, unconditional love. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I had you know when my wife was dying, uh, the uh, hospice people were more worried about me than about my wife, and and they kept asking me these personal questions, and finally the the lead of the a woman said, looked at me very, with a very worried face, and she said, "Why do you seem so happy?" <laughs> and she said, "Well, my wife is dying," and, and it took me a while to really understand fully that myself. But uh, I ha- think I think I've got a handle on it, and it's uh, it's uh, explained uh, in the at the very end of the manuscript that I'm now right working on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I, we haven't got the time to get into that, but but uh, Rhonda will see it uh, here in a week or two, and uh, and maybe we could bring that back up as a separate topic on some other 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 time. But uh, that was that was exactly it. I was joyful in in the midst of the sorrow over losing my wife of 48 years, and uh, she was a saint in her own right. That's for sure. Well, she was going before you, and you knew that you would have her before the Lord advocating for you. Well, yes, yes, uh, but he, it, well, I, it, it, maybe maybe we need a whole hour to talk about that. <laughs> it's it's more complicated than that. Yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, the, I guess the point I want to make is that uh, there this joy, and then there is real joy. And uh, our uh, attempt to, uh, or our choices of of avocation in old age, gets us the first level. Yeah, but you don't get to the total level of joy, uh, unconditional and, and continuous, without uh, without the Holy Spirit. That would be a good subject because that I've, I've had a very similar experience when my first wife died. Uh, Al, very similar. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so if we ever get into that subject, uh, there's a lot to share on that, too. Good. Okay. I'll make a note. Well, we have a few minutes left. Yeah, Al, um, we've actually gotten into uh, gotten ourselves into next week's uh, topic. I'll mention that. Uh, uh we're in a three a three week series, and the the last week, which is next week, will be joy found in studies, in all forms of teaching, and in spiritual progress. And it looks like we've gotten into the spiritual progress part, but so we can bring bring up this topic again next week and uh, and can you continue some discussion of it. I think we could just say, you know, why do the hello, hello. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're the. Oh, my phone made funny sounds. Okay, I think we could widen that topic. Um, you know, the spiritual in the spiritual can include things like joy and gratitude for our grandchildren and things like that. You know. Hello. Yeah. Yes. It, Hello. It, it sounds like a good topic for the 30th of December discussion. Paying off mortgages. <laughs> that can be joyful, but at a certain level, that's true. <laughs> Downsizing. So you can see, my friends, listen in next. This this is being taped today, but listen in to the next show too, which will be you will be. Well, you'll be listening to one week from this one, whenever it is. And, well, it's always, uh, you're going to come Rhonda, up with unexpected stuff. Look at it this way, Rhonda. It's always next week. It's always next week. Yeah. But we're supposed to live in the now. No, but I mean, <laughs> when, you're, when you're talking I mean, about this program, when you're talking about next week, it is. it will be next 
It'll be next exactly. week when they hear it. You'll see. Exactly. See what I mean? Right. And so we, we shouldn't yeah. be putting in dates because that's confusing no. to people then. No. Just You can still continue to say next week we'll talk about this and that and so forth. Yeah, but if you say December 1st or January 30th. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, that's correct. That's what but I that meant. was. Look, but look I think that was, only for, that was only for our... Uh, for, for our uh, uh, information. But anyway. You, well, you can see we've done big things with manana. <laughs> yes, we right. multiplied it by seven. <laughs> well, we've had with us today our uh, panelists, uh, Dr. Rhonda Churvin, who is now in, uh, in uh, not Las Corpus, Cruces, Corpus but Christi. in Corpus Christi, Texas. Stingrays. And Rhonda, how shall I describe you now? Say that again. Now, you told me that how, how to... How a Catholic, to... I'm now a Catholic writer in Corpus Christi, Texas. Catholic writer, okay. And then we have uh, Dr. James Hannick from Los Angeles, philosophy professor, father of five children, pro-life activist, editor at New Oxford Review, and Commander Al Hughes from Corpus Christi, who now... Rhonda and uh, Jim are uh, neighbors now, close neighbors. Colonel in the Air Force, a married father who converted to the church from atheism and also has degrees in engineering and in pastoral studies. And we didn't hear from Richard, and he didn't answer his phone when I called him, so we'll have to check on Richard. But we'll be back next week, same time, uh, same station. And Rhonda, I love it when you close with a prayer. We thank you, Jesus, for all these joys we mentioned, the joys connected with beauty, the joys connected with studying new things, and the joy of communicating what we learn and what we appreciate with each other. And we thank you for radio and websites and computers that makes all this possible. That's right. Please Amen. bless everyone who is listening with more joy. Amen. 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 When I pray over people, I will say, give them more joy, Lord, more love, more, more uh, 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 peace, more peace, more love, more joy. This one fellow would call me after he got home in Missouri after uh, experiencing this, and he said, man, that was getting so much, my chest almost broke. <laughs> <laughs> so it does, it works. It works. So we'll see you next week, each and every one. God bless. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day. Show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day. Show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day. Show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.